Morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Really excited to be here with you today to talk about our latest update and how to use our new custom variables to make better games. So today we're going to go through an introduction to custom variables. We're going to show you some use cases and tutorials of how you can use these in your models uh, to speed up your model building process and hopefully make even more fantastic games. Also, all the models that we've created for today's session, these are going to be published to the community. Uh, so if you uh, follow, look, look me up, I'm Matthew Morris, uh, look me up in the community and follow me, you'll see all of the models that we produce for these sessions. So my name's Matthew, I'm the evangelist for Machinations. I've uh, been around in the games industry for a long while and alongside me today as ever is the amazing Cesar. Say hello, Cesar. Uh, hello everyone, hope you will enjoy the webinar and I really hope you will learn something from it. So first up, before we launch ourselves into machinations, what have we changed and um, what are custom variables? Well, for those of you that have been using machinations for a while, we used to have global variables. There were only four of them. Uh, you couldn't change what letters were being used. You couldn't change the name of them. And they were fairly limited. And it's one of those things where it's been on our backlog of things to um, overhaul for quite some time. And this has produced our biggest update so far in machinations history so we now have the ability to customize the names so i think was it like strength randomness strategy and a couple of others uh now you can completely customize those uh we've added a lot more functionality including the integration of maths.js into these plus external data sources as well um you can utilize the same variables in multiple models so we'll go through and show you that workflow today how you can set up one variable and then copy it into whichever models you're using and automate the data entry from multiple sources. So really cutting down that workflow time if you're working with live data and live ops, cutting that down so that you can be much more productive in machinations, hopefully avoiding that nasty copy and paste process that uh, you often have to go through. First things first, we have to highlight this amazing feature for the webinar at least, which is the ability of me having machinations on full screen and not having to hide my tabs and everything, which is the most amazing things. One of the most amazing things we've ever had. So I'm grateful for that. But moving on to custom variables, um, we will have like, for those of you who are familiar with our 101s, 102, um, we call this the 103, maybe it's not the best name for it, but in it, we just, have a look at different types of custom variables, how you can configure them, what they can be used for, and uh, it, it really the easiest way to implement them because we have really simple models in here. You'll see there's not a lot of them, but um, we try and cover every case uh, that we have so far. Also, I should mention that we are still working on improving them. So this is by no means the final version uh, of them. So expect, even, even more functionality in the future. Uh, to kick things off, uh, I guess the first, the first place to start is where do we find custom variables? You can see on the left side that we have our, uh, our bar here has been changed a bit. We have a bit uh, more, let's say different things, starting off with libraries at the top, images, variables, layers, and history. We're gonna be focusing on custom variables today. Maybe at the end, we'll have a look at images and layers for a bit, but the main focus will be custom variables. As I open custom variables, you can immediately notice uh, the tabs at the top here, which are diagram, private, and team. We're gonna talk about the, the three of them a bit later. Uh, in the diagram section, you notice that we have a bunch of variables on the left here each with their own names and values. Now, for the first couple of variables that we have here, I purposely uh, left them, uh, let's say I, I've disabled them, so I've, I've deleted them just so we can create them live and we can see how, how the process works. Inside the resource connection here, we have a variable called dice. So first thing to note is we can use those variables straight on the resource connections. There's no need to use an extra register and connect that to the resource connection. We can type the variable name directly onto the resource connection and it will work as intended. 
On the right here, if we have a look, if I have a search for dice, we're gonna see no results. I haven't defined a variable yet, so we should go ahead and do that just now. Uh, when you wanna add the custom variable, on the top right here, you see add new. You have four options uh, to select from at the moment, more to be added, randomness, math expression, external JSON, and live market feeds. Most of the time, I I don't want to jinx it, but I believe most of the time people will choose math expression. Um, we can also, but in our case for dice, we will be choosing the randomness variable. Now, as I selected randomness, you can see on my left side here, randomness interval, I have a bunch of parameters that I have to fit. First will be the name of the variable. In order to, to fit the model that I have here, I'm gonna name it as dice. Uh, the, then we have our type, which is interval, array, or external RNG. I'm gonna leave it as interval from now. We will name it, so we have from and to, which is basically lowest value to highest value. Um, I'm going to put from 1 to 10. And we have distribution, uniform, or Gaussian. I'm going to leave it as uniform just to simulate a dice. And update can be on play or each step. So if I were to select play, for instance, let me save it just as it is right now. This should give us a random number between 1 and 10. So think of it as a 10-sided dice. I'm going to leave it to update on play, save it. We have it as dice. Now, if I hit step, we're gonna notice I just transferred seven resources, three, eight. So I am basically rolling a dice every time. And if I put it to a step again, I am rolling a dice every time. So as I have it here with all on the, on the drain, it's because I want to drain every resource at every step. Those connections are instant just so we don't see the resources moving around. If I were to set them to interval, we can actually see the tokens moving around. We set them as instant because it's easier to follow. So instead of, uh, this is a, a basic example because for, pro, for one to 10, even before we had functionality, we could have written D10, obviously. But uh, it's just a simple way to, to show how the randomness variable is implemented. And for the second example in which we have to create a variable ourselves, we have, uh, as you can see on the right here, we have this very professional uh, categorization. Yeah, as a fixed number, which means that we have, uh, in, in, before the converter here, Let's say we are collecting currency over time and we want to convert it into items. And it has a certain cost of converting a certain amount of currency into one item. For the purpose of this small example, let's just say that is that number is uh, 2000. I'm gonna add a new variable in here, math expression, name it cost. So it, uh, it matches the, the name here, give it a description cost of converting one item, you see. And the formula we can, so even though it says formula, we can just type a simple number in here, hit save, and it will work properly. So right now, what will happen is when I hit play, whenever I reach 2000 currency in here, because we will have the cost variable set as 2000, <clears throat> we will be able to convert into one item. Now, some of you might say, why is this useful when I can just type 2000 in here? And that's a valid question. But for that to be answered, I think we were gonna, I'm gonna have to hand over to Matthew to show you the Mackie Cats model. And yeah, and exactly why that's such a big deal, especially for those of you and their I hope there are some in here that have built massive models and have a lot of connections and nodes. You're gonna see why that's so important. That was the slickest segue ever, Cesar. Thank you very much. While I'm loading that up, there's a quick question from the audience. Does this mean that the old notion of using dice will not work anymore and it has to be done this way? No, of course not. Uh, 
you, the dice is the same as before, D <clears throat> and a number, uh, but you can also think of it as if you are throwing, I don't know, 10 different dices uh, in 10 different places, instead of going and typing D6 in every single place, you can just define your own dice variable and have it as dice. It gives you a bit, I would say, a bit more control. And also, if you want to throw, because I've seen people trying to, if you want to throw, for instance, two dices, right? And you can do the D6 plus D6, but you can also define your dice variable as a Gaussian between 2 and 12. And yeah. Perfect. So just as just as I was saying, here's here's a model we did a little while ago. This is the Mackie Cats uh, game economy that we did um, in a previous session. Uh, I'm sure Horia later on can drop into the chat the link to that YouTube video if you want to go back and see how we built this model. But one of the things that we did here in this model is we have a uh, player persona, and we use this to pick a number between one and nine to select which persona we were going to be testing in this simulation. And this was a great way of doing it. We had one pool. Uh, we could update this um, to whichever persona type we wanted. And then these connections went all over the canvas uh, and it picked the, the trait that that particular persona had for each of the different variables that we defined. And some of these links were quite complex. They kind of went all over the place. And this starts to get quite time consuming, laying all these um, state connections all over the map and uh, making it quite confusing to try and keep up with it. This is where our new uh, custom variables really come into their own. What I've done this time is rather than uh, have it already in my diagram, I've set up a private custom variable. Now, here we've got these three options. We've got our custom variables we have allocated on this diagram. We have private custom variables. So these are the ones that you'll set up and just unique to your profile. And then we have our team custom variables. With our team custom variables, they're shared across your team. So anybody logging in on the same account can see these custom variables and can then add them to their model. When we add them to the model, we click the little three dots here We've got two options. We've got three options. First one, to delete it. We don't want to do that today. But then we have these two um, options, which are used in this diagram or copy to this diagram. And there's a big difference between the two. So when we copy this to the diagram, uh, you'll see it's, it's moved it from private into the diagram. Um, so I can then see the details that I have for it. Um, when I copy it, it's going to effectively create a brand new copy of that custom variable. And then when we um, use it inside this model, it's just going to take that custom variable. It's still linked to the either the private or the team um, custom variables folder. Uh, so that means if someone were to change it, we could go back and change it. But here, just as we had before, I, rather than using a pool, I've now set up the word persona to be uh, how I'm selecting which persona I'm going to be simulating inside here. So rather than uh, using the letter A from that pool, I'm just going to drop the word persona in there. It means I can delete these ugly state connections, uh, try and work out where this other one loops around to. Here it is, hidden here somewhere. And that means I can get rid of that state connection. And one more to go somewhere. There it is. I can get rid of that state connection. I hope that's the last one. I can get rid of that pool altogether. So now, rather than uh, having to go through update that pool, just in my custom variable, I can select which persona I want to um, change, uh, update that here. So when I'm running my simulation, that's the persona that's then going to be used in in um, during that simulation. I can then obviously adjust that as often and as frequently as I want to. The other example that we then have is just as Cesar was saying, we've, in this model, we've got lots and lots of times where we've put in 1,200 as the base breeding cost uh, and how many tokens it's going to take to breed a couple of Mackie cats to produce a new uh, kind of infant Mackie cat. And to go through and uh, update all of these would be super time consuming. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this in the diagram rather than copying it. So I'm going to effectively leave it connected to my team folder. Now in here where I have the uh, the 1200, I'm going to replace this with recost. The beauty of this is that now it means that I can um, update all of the instances where I have that breed cost. And you can see there's lots and lots and lots of times where I'm using that in this model. It'd be a real pain for me to go through and update that across all of the simulations, all of the instances at the same time. But now, rather than doing that, I can update that live directly in here. Now, because I've linked this to the team um, custom variable, this means that Chesar can actually go in and make changes to that custom variable. So if Chesar is working on another model and decides, actually, we want to update that breed cost now. So rather than it costing 1200, uh, he's going to update it for me and make it cost a different amount. It's going to automatically update in this model. So there, Chesar has just updated that for me. So now rather than costing 1200, it's now costing 2000. And this is really, really powerful, especially when we start working with uh, JSON imports or um, market variables, where if we've got those linked in the team, our team members might go through and even change the sources of the JSON import or change something. Uh, as long as you're linked and you're connected to that original um, custom variable, as they make those changes, it's going to update in your model as well means it's so much easier and faster to be working with uh, data, especially across the team. And uh, once we get into those kind of JSON imports. Um, so the, the idea now of this kind of workflow is that as we're going through, I can now jump into my diagram tab, pick which persona I want to then go through and simulate. I'm gonna pick number eight. Uh, we've set our breed cost, and now I'm gonna hit my batch plays. I can run my simulations, see what impact these variables have on my economy, understand the impact that uh, kind of tweaking these can have, rather than me having to go through and update the breed cost all that many times, which would just be uh, a mind-numbingly boring task. I can now update that live, save that, and then rerun my simulations without having to waste all that time going through updating each of them really having a massive impact on the speed and complexity of uh, how you can start iterating quickly with your game economies. Oh, there's a great question that's come in here. Uh, Cesar, what's the difference between randomness update on play and each step? It seems to be the same. The idea behind it is the play, if, if it's set to update on play, it should uh, work in the same way as random registers used to work before, where you have an initial value that is indeed randomly selected, but that value carries through uh, the entire execution. While if it's selected each step, it should update automatically every step, which those that have worked in maculations can remember that you used to do a little trick before updating the register and such. Uh, I will say that it was well spotted because I have also noticed uh, just now that the uh, play one, the update on play one updates every step as well. So uh, we're gonna have to look into that. Oh, really? Yeah. I was just gonna build a little construction and test it. Yeah, that's better because we, uh, we can also show, oh, you made two different ones, okay. Almost there. Here we go. So the big difference here should be. Oh, by the way, see what Matthew has said. Uh, the variables are case sensitive. So. Oh well, what? Thank you, Chesa. I know you did that intentionally, Matthew. I, and... I did. I just wanted to make it clear that they were um, case sensitive. In case anybody missed that. Um, so the big difference here would then be that on um, the play, it should then select one number at the start of the simulation, and then that's going to be the same number each time, whereas on the step, that number is going to be updating each step. We then have the, this option here of uniform or Gaussian. Um, Gaussian 
produces that beautiful Gaussian curve of probability so that the numbers in the middle of the of the interval were more likely to be selected than the ones at the ends of it uh, as well as doing a kind of interval we can create an array so we can set up a, like a matrix array if you like of numbers that could be selected again all just cut down the amount of objects you need on your canvas and make kind of building these models much much faster Cesar, I think you've got a couple of other uh, good examples of custom variables in your model there. So I'll yeah, stop uh, sharing and hand back over to you. Sure. I was just reading the Q&A. I think those questions should be, we should leave them for after the main presentation, because I believe we'll have a lot of time at the end to answer questions. Uh, they were okay. pretty general. So, But if uh, anyone has any question related to what I'm presenting right now, Matthew, please interrupt me. I will. All right, so we have a couple of more to show. Uh, I'm just going to go through them one by one. And the first one would be a, an array. So those of you, again, that have previously suffered with arrays and you know that you write a giant array inside the register and then there is this 10 kilometers of text going around the diagram. Uh, as a math expression, by the way, I'm not going to create the rest of them on the spot. They were previously created, but we can have a look at them. Um, we can see on the array here, we have it as a math expression. It's an array of values. Uh, I named it array because I don't have imagination. And in the formula field, you can see that I added a bunch of values, random values, no real meaning behind them. And uh, the update is irrelevant. I mean, you can choose whichever because it, it doesn't matter for the array here. And as the array, uh, you can see that uh, I have an index here, which I'm defining inside of the diagram, right? And what happens when I hit play, let's actually do step by step, is that for every resource that comes in here, the index increases. So I read the next number of the array. So you can see we are at the second position right now, which is uh, the value 20, then comes 25, 45, and so on. So we can easily build an array inside of the math expression here and just uh, use it in different places. Again, instead of having imagined that you had the same array and you wanted to use it five different times and it was a giant array, it would be a lot of text clogging your diagram and it's easily available now. What we also want to show with the next one, so we are using the same array. So since it has the same name, it's, it's the same one from here. And we are also using lookup as a variable. Uh, lookup, you can see it's just a simple number. You can see the description, it's the number to select, and it's the formula is a simple three. So basically array lookup will return the third value from the array in our case, 25. That will happen constantly. Unless we change lookup, it's gonna be 25 constantly. An important thing to highlight here, which I also mentioned in the beginning is the fact that you can type the variables directly onto the resource connection. So no need for that extra register that has to do, has to, you know, overwrite with an equal or add with a plus one. You can type straight onto the, the resource connection and it frees up a lot of space. Next, we have a bit of a combination here, which is going to be randomness plus external JSON. For the external JSON one, I expect uh, many questions, but we have a very, very, very basic Example of it. Oh, uh, we have... Just a short sure. question. Yeah. Um, can you change the variable from the model? So, in that last example where you had array and the lookup, okay. uh, as in add one to the lookup value. So, kind of taking data back into the custom variable. So, change it to a four? Uh, so, I think, I think the answer to that at the moment is no. Um, oh, you want to? Okay, I understand. Can't take uh, data from a uh, machinations model that's running and feed that back into the custom variables yet. And I say yet because you're definitely not the first person to ask for it, um, but it's it's coming. Yeah, so a lot of people has, have asked 
So if I have this pool here and it gets resources during the execution, right? Can I use this value inside of a custom variable? I think that's what you're asking. And uh, it's probably the most frequently asked question that we have. Uh, and it's definitely one of the first updates that we'll introduce to this because we see that a lot of people need it. I need it. I understand why it's important. But at the moment, data from within the model cannot feed back into the variables. Uh, it's only predetermined values, so to speak. Yeah. The way, the way around that, I guess, would be rather than doing that on a um, resource connection, would be to use that array lookup in a register and then have that register you know adding another number to the lookup so using the lookup as a starting point and then plus letter a or whatever from a pool that had that uh, number in it yeah to, to be fair the the workaround let's call it for for this behavior is to use machinations in the same way as before global variables right because that's the way you used to do it so it's not tragic but it's definitely something we're looking uh, into implementing Excellent. Moving on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the variable that we'll be using here is spawn rate. Uh, let me find it. You can see it's an external JSON. We have a URL here, which actually I can show. It's public. It's for a Pokemon that database. We have a list of different Pokemons in here, starting from uh, the classics. Um, you can see that they have a bunch of information in here. The information that we selected was the average spawns from the second ID Pokemon, Ibisaur. Uh, average spawns is 4.2. In order to access that information, the way in which we uh, wrote the diagram is Pokemon gave it the index, which is one, those of you that have dabbled with programming know why you start the index from zero and then dot average spawns. So we get that exact variable in here. And we are going to see in the register here when I hit step that it returns the exact value of 4.2. If we were to ever make changes to, to the JSON file, uh, we have a refresh button in here. Of course, it's not going to refresh anything right now because the value is there. And that 4.2, we can use it as a random chance for uh, for the Pokemon to actually spawn. So we have it as 4.2 with a plus 1%. We can do 0% plus 1%. Most of you uh, probably know this. And we can have our spawning here. Obviously, you can imagine we can extract. Uh, if we go back to the JSON here, you can we can extract a lot of different data from here. We can create a lot of different variables. We can even, you know, make them as arrays or other things. So uh, definitely a lot easier to pull external data uh, and use it in the model. And a lot easier to update it because you can just update it and then refresh the values in here and it's, it's all there. So uh, moving on, I think there's only a couple left that I have to do. The first one would be market feeds as we have on the left. <clears throat> this is a very, very, very dumb model. It's just to show uh, how market feeds work. I have variable here, which is selected as live market feeds. This is more for the, the Web3 uh, folks, let's say. Uh, I, I named it ETH. You can name it whatever. We have two markets at the moment to select from, Binance and OpenSea. Projects, there are a ton. I selected Ethereum to US, uh, USDT. And the stat is last price. In here, you can see that I have a value, which is 1,531. If I hit refresh, the value is going to change. Every time I hit refresh, almost it's going to change because the price is uh, constantly changing. And that number will become basically the value of it. So it's uh, no longer required to constantly go and check what the value is and come into the, uh, then go back to the model, update it, and so on. You can just hit refresh in here. The model is just, it's a very dumb model just to show that you can use the variable basically and collecting one uh, ether every step and it's just increasing the value. And the last one that we have, uh, at least 
for me, because Matthew is going to present all this nonsense on the bottom. We have market fits with AMM model. And this is um, just to show a combination of how you can use those market feeds into your AMM model. Now make no mistake, this is a very basic model in which I only simulate the selling of a virtual token into uh, a market, into a automated market maker. Uh, we can see a couple of things here. Uh, one would be I am using ETH as the Ethereum value to make it more uh, accurate when I'm trying to calculate the price. And another very important thing to be noticed here is that I am using the dice variable, which is the dice variable at the beginning in two different places. Now, there are two, th there's a thought that may cross your mind here, which is what if the dice here rolls a six and a, the dice on the bottom rolls a two? Well, that's not actually happening. When you have a randomness variable such as we have dice here, no matter how many instances of dice you have in your model, they will all roll the same amount on the same step. So in the first step, if I am to roll, I guess I rolled a 10, this dice on, on in the register here will also be a 10 and every other dice in the diagram, even the one on the top probably, yeah, it's also a 10. So all of them are tens all over the place. So because of that, you can safely use the same random value in multiple places at the same time, and you will know that it will give you the same value and uh, not, not worry about it. Other than that, the model is very basic, just uh, I am selling one token and uh, removing USD from the other liquidity pool, trying to keep the value. We can, if we want to look at the value here, I do believe we've uh, shown this previously, we have a, a global property here, which can show us the decimals. If I set it to zero, two, we can see that it barely at four decimals, we get any value and we can go even further beyond and show very, very small numbers as we can see here. But other than that, I think we are left with our most little complicated model, which Matthew gladly wanted to present. So I'm gonna hand over to him. Thank you, Cesar. Uh, I don't know about the most complex, but I think quite a few people have been asking this question as we've been as we've been going through. So uh, I thought I'd save this until uh, we can show it to you in this model. So I've got a couple of variables that I've set up here. The first one is um, from OpenSea. So I've picked a project from OpenSea through the list, and I'm just pulling in its floor price. Well, its floor price when it gets pulled in, this is pulling it in in Ethereum. And that's all very well and good, but I'm all about the cash and I want to know how much money this is. So I've also pulled in from the marketplace Ethereum. So I'm pulling in that USDT price so I can see how much it's worth. I can hit the little fresh here. Uh, this one's quite nice because it's constantly updating. So as I click it, it's showing me in real time what's going on in the marketplace right now for Ethereum to US dollar. Then in this maths expression, I'm using these custom variables inside here. So I can use, uh, I'm very simply, I'm just taking how, what's the floor price of mini combat right now in Ethereum, uh, multiplying that by the USDT Ethereum price and combining those to create my floor price for the project. So without having to go through and look, look up into any of those markets to see what those variables are, I can do all of that inside a maths expression. So in answer to the question you had there, of can you use custom variables inside a maths expression? Yes, you definitely can. And it creates a huge amount of options of how you combine these to be to do all sorts of very, very powerful um, insights into what's going on with the economy. Most importantly, it means that without having to go through and um, make any changes, I can update the update these in real time and use that in this silly little model I've built. It's not that complex. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking that floor price that I've just calculated with the market. Uh, I wanted to show you that you can still do maths JS in here. So I've multiplied it by a hundred. So I'm getting cents rather than dollars. So I can have those decimal points in my model. And then I've got a little bit of mechanism here, just that's gonna look at where my uh, floor price is gonna go in the future. 
So I'm adjusting my four pice randomly here. It's either going to go up or down by a random D50 each time. 50-50 chance of it going up and down. I've also looked at how many uh, sales were going on. So I've looked at that same project and in the past 24 hours, how many sales have been made. Super important if, you want to look, if you're working on a Web3 project that's going to be trading in OpenSea or anywhere else, you're going to have those marketplace transaction fees. And it's, you're probably going to be very keen to find out what's going to be happening with those and how much money you're going to be making. So uh, I've updated that number. Let's see what it is now. Oh, it's gone up slightly. Um, so that number's gone up. So I'm going to up, rerun my simulation. Uh, and now I can, I've updated this with live prices, live sales, and I can use this to calculate how much money I'm going to be making. So just in this little simulation, I'm then looking at the black line here is showing how much money we're going to be making. I've looked at the min max and I've just randomized where my floor price of my project's going to go. Now, in a, in a real world, um, hopefully, rather than just doing a, a random plus or minus D50, uh, you might have a bit more logic around you know, what's happening with the supply and demand of your game and how many NFTs are you um, producing, how many are being burned, and all these other mechanics that would impact the market, rather than my very silly little example. But really important just to show you how you combine custom variables using a maths expression to create that type of logic without having to do it on the canvas itself. So very, very powerful. Uh, question there, will automated interval refreshing be available in the future? Chizar, do you want to answer that one? I think it's talking about the kind of market data. So yeah. I think that, sorry, you go ahead, Chizar. No. Uh... I guess it's talking about auto auto refreshing the the line. I guess the the best approach, um, and I do believe that it's a feature that has been requested, is to auto refresh every single variable when you hit batch play, right, or play, whatever. When you hit play or batch play, it should auto refresh all of the variables. Uh, I believe you should also have the option of selecting the variables that you do not want to refresh. I don't know why you would want to do that, but I guess having the option would be nice. So it's definitely one of the uh, feedbacks that we've received. So we're looking into it. That's all I can say right now. <laughs> yeah. And that's exactly what we'll see here. So right now, you'll see that this is kind of grayed out. Um, this feature will be added in right here. So you'll be, be able to select exactly how that gets updated. Yeah. One thing I would just say, um, about the the live market feeds at the moment. If I go up to the top here and select OpenSea. There are a lot of projects in OpenSea and we're working on a feature right now to tidy this up to make it easier to find your the project you're interested in. We're also going to be adding a lot more different options from different markets into these custom variables, including analytics platforms, uh, kind of market data platforms and all sorts of other sources to uh, yeah, and if you have any requests, if there's anything you particularly like us to, to add into these live market feeds or these data sources, it will really help us prioritize what we need to focus on to get integrated with machinations. So please do drop us a note, chat to us in the Discord or anywhere else. We've got another question. Uh, would there be a way to update the value of these variables procedurally while the simulation is running? Let's suppose my graph models the power of a character according to the level using custom variable power equals level two, uh, but that from level 50, I need to change the formula to power equals level four and level 100, it changes to power level equals 16. Would it be possible to use these new variables to model the system? You want me to take that? Uh, so as we previously said there is no way at the moment to return data from the model into the variable but for the specific formula that you're asking it's definitely possible to build it it's just that you need to be careful about the way in which you build your formula so since you have pretty clear rules in there uh, which is i you need to change the it's 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 a very 
clear formula, right? Power equals two times level, and from level 50, it's four times level, and for level 100, 16 times level, you can actually build like a large formula and that can serve as your global variable in a sense, but it would have to be that large formula instead of reading, you know, back from the uh, from the from the pool or wherever you store the level into into the the custom variable. So it's definitely possible to build it. It's not really related to custom variables, though. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Mo. It's good to know June is definitely on the list, a uh, high priority list of us to integrate with. Uh, we're chatting internally about that this week. Uh, I know a lot of people are using June as their analytics, especially in kind of Web3. So we'll definitely be integrating that as soon as possible. Please do, if you have any other questions, feel free to drop them into the chat or into the Q&A. Yeah, we kind of we kind of scheduled this in a way so we have time for, for Q&A. So please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Yeah. I think the couple of things I've been finding really, really powerful is certainly how much neater my models are uh, with custom variables, cutting down the amount of those long connections I'm kind of dragging around, uh, combining those into um, into kind of one custom variable that I you know, I don't have to run those connections for any time, and definitely where I've got the same the same number of lots of times in a model, uh, rather than kind of repetitively going through it, just makes life so much easier. Oh, of course, and it's on the commodity side. It's it's actually you had two options before. If you want to do, let's say, something that resembles a global variable, before you had two options. One was you copy and paste the same number over and over in all of the places. The second one was like Matthew showed in the Mackie Cats model where you have that persona pool, which then branches into different places of your diagram. So both of them have a lot of disadvantages. Let's say the, the pool one has the disadvantage of being very messy. You cannot, uh, if you have the Mackie Cats model is not a very big model, let's call it that way. If you have you will have models that are 1,000, 2,000 nodes. Maybe you need to use the persona in 10 different places. You're going to see connections flying around. You might even connect them wrong. I, I think the thing that I like the most about it is that it leaves very little room for error, right? If I had a number in 50 different places and I had to go and manually switch it, you can be sure that I would forget to switch it in at least two or three places when I'm in a hurry, right? So having that extra commodity of just going on the on the left side, changing a variable once and it updates all of the values. So that's that's priceless to me at least. And if any of you have worked with large models, I bet you've all felt this sentiment of my God, it's so messy and it's just there's so many connections that I need to drag around to make this work. And just being able to eliminate them is uh, it is very helpful both for reading the diagram and for the person that's actually modeling as well. So uh, a couple of great questions. Well, I think one's not necessarily a question, it's a request. Uh, when can we get a max, a variable uh, on a pool's max resource count? Uh, I know we're, we're, it's definitely on our roadmap. We'll get there um, soon. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of insight into our, our kind of next roadmap item shortly. Um, but another great question. For larger diagrams, are there types of global variables that are more or less demanding on performance? Performance. I will say so. First of all, I don't claim to know everything that happens with the orchestrator of machinations. I don't really know what happens in the background. I know two things <laughs> that I will share with everyone. <laughs> One is if you have a lot of computations that will slow down your diagram. So be careful of how many computations you have per step. You can think of a computation as transferring a resource from one place to another, updating a register, uh, updating a resource connection, things like that, right? That's a computation. Imagine that you have 2000 nodes and you have a lot of formulas in there and you have a lot of resources moving around. Those create a lot of computation. Uh, the other one would be uh, <clears throat> moving resources through gates. So the way in which gates distribute resources 
I might be not 100% correct, but I do believe that's the case. And I have examples to back me up. The way in which gates process resources is on an individual level. So if you have gates that are handling a, num a large number of resources, let's say you have 1 million resources that you want to pass through a random gate with three outputs, uh, that might be slow because each of that, each one of those 1 million resources will be calculated when they reach the gate to see which output they have to select. Of course, that's 1 million. Imagine doing 100 billion, right? Imagine having seven of those. That's going to slow your execution dramatically. So th those two are the ones that I believe slow down executions the most. I do believe they are both unrelated to custom variables. That was always the case. I do not think there are custom variables. I do not believe so, but I confess I'm not proficient enough yet and I haven't used them to that extent yet to be able to make such a claim, but I do believe that custom variables do not impact performance so far. So. Yeah, I will just do a quick uh, update on that. Um, this is a very silly little model I just doodled while we've been talking. It used to be that um, deterministic gates would um, also kind of kill the performance. And you can see I've just created a very ridiculously uh, exponential loop uh, so every resource that comes through this gate, it's basically going to this pool that's feeding back of how many resources are being created. Uh, kind of a couple of revisions ago, uh, we pushed out an update. So this used to completely kill machinations if you were to do something like this and you were to start putting billions or trillions of resources through the same gate. Uh, we've done a lot of work to kind of improve that. So you can see I was pushing uh, 30 decimal places worth of resources through this gate each step and it was still very fast and performant so we've done a we're always constantly working in the background we have these big flashy updates that we do like custom variables we're adding all this content and functionality but in the background our dev team are feverishly beavering away to make machinations more and more efficient uh, and uh, even great uh, like little updates like this that you probably wouldn't have noticed unless you're kind of doing a lot of um high numbered resources going through gates you probably would have noticed it but our team are continuously working on these improvements and making a big difference uh a couple of questions yeah one one of them is especially for you matthew uh, will we get a recorded version of this webinar yes yes, yes as always uh but the good news is today i think i've only seen that question asked twice so that's a good improvement. It's a good step forward for us. Yes, they're always recorded. They'll be on our on our YouTube channel uh, next week. Um, what about pulling data from external spreadsheets? Uh, really excitingly, we expect to have that um, in an update coming very, very soon. I've uh, been working with the team on exactly that workflow. We're looking at streamlining that. It effectively will utilize some of the development we've already done around um, the JSON imports um, to pull data directly from um, all sorts of different uh, Google Sheets, I think is the primary one, but we'll be able to pull data directly from Google Sheets directly into machinations. But one, actually, I might just share this top tip just because I discovered it a little while ago and it kind of blew my mind. Um, this is a, a Google Sheet that I'm working on for a demo that we've got coming up shortly. And here I've got, I was building arrays. Uh, so I've got these arrays with these giant numbers. I think I've got a hundred different numbers in here. There's this great function called text join inside a spreadsheet. Um, by putting text join, the little um, comma in, in between some quotation marks, that's what that's the delimiter that sets what's in between each of the numbers. Uh, then you can either set false or true should, should you ignore empty cells and then the array. And what this does is it creates a uh, giant set of um, numbers that you can then really easily just drop into a um, into a uh, register and create that array. So a really fast kind of workflow to move data from, uh, you know, wouldn't want to have to type out a hundred numbers or play around with this data at all. You can literally just jump, dump it all into one cell, 
copy and paste that directly into an array, add the square brackets, and you're good to go. Uh, but we're working on um, streamlining that even further so it'll be automated. Great question just in the chat there from Laura. Will the Google Sheets need to be publicly accessible to be accessible from machinations like JSONs currently require? So uh, I don't want to preempt that too much. It's definitely something we're working on. Um, I think the, what we're hoping the, the we can get to would be this: if you you'll have to be logged into machinations with Google, uh, and you'll have to then be logged into the Google Sheets, which you have access to with that same Google account, and so effectively it will be secured. It won't have to be made public. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Laura. Bear with us while we're working on that and we hope to have it out as quickly as possible. But uh, security is definitely at the top of our minds. Understand that JSONs, um, in order for that to function, it's got to be public right now, which isn't ideal if you've got sensitive data. So we're definitely going to um, be adding more, um, more functionality around that, but security always top of mind for us. Uh, do you have an onboarding system past the basic automated tutorials on the website? What do you recommend these days, Chesa, once you've been through the automated tutorials? Uh, well, uh, whenever I get asked on intercom, I guess the easiest answer is watch the 101. <laughs> That's definitely the best place to start. Uh, I would recommend the 101 video, the 102 video, and now, or rather, soon the 103 video as well so yeah the, the 101 is definitely the best place we go through each and every node each and every connection we explain what they do where they should be used how to use them it's just a comprehensive guide of, of everything that machinations has to offer so I, I would say that's definitely the best place to start and also as always practice is the best teacher also, uh, I don't know if we're ready to introduce him yet. We've had a brand new member of the team join Machinations uh, who's focusing on an enablement. So he's the new head of enablement for Machinations. We're going to introduce him on one of these webinars coming up very soon. Uh, and he's going to be taking, a, uh, he's been working very, very hard on improving the entire kind of um, onboarding process and education process to help all of our community uh, make better models inside machinations and make better games. Any other questions? Oh, thank you very much for those um, links, Janadi. Definitely going to check those out and looking forward to seeing what they do. Um, I, that's exactly the sort of workflows we've been looking at kind of converting Google sheet, Sheets into JSON. Um, and I know that our R&D team have already, actually, I think they've already um, been able to do it and get that data directly from Google Sheets. Um, we're just working on integrating that and making it as seamless and as smooth as possible. But uh, thanks, I'm definitely gonna check out those links. Thank you very much. Perfect. I mean, we're good on time. If there aren't any other questions. Yeah, I think we're very good. So I did tease that we we're going to talk about what's on in the roadmap next. So the big focus for us at the moment, as well as kind of adding the, all the functionality I've been talking about today, the big focus for us is, is going back, looking at the chart again. And um, one of the things you'll notice, especially when it comes to running large numbers of simulations, is that Chrome starts to creak under the pressure of if you've got a thousand steps and you run uh, and you've got a hundred variables uh, that you're tracking in the chart and you try and load all of that into Chrome at the same time, Chrome can start to creak a little bit, uh, you know, and take up even more RAM. So what we're doing is we're working on a big improvement for the charts where all of the simulations are done in the cloud, just as they are right now with our batch plays. But rather than sending every single point of data back to you, it's going to send back aggregated data only. So your averages and your indicators will come down to your local PC and you'll be able to manipulate those in the chart. But you won't have to 
start to feel that lag when you've got several several hundred thousand data points trying to be stored in Chrome at the same time. It's a really big focus for us so that you can speed up um, that testing time, speed up those iterations, and uh, improve the performance of machinations overall. Uh, machinations on other browsers soon. Uh, where are we with Safari now, Cesar? Are we, are we there yet? I know it's been worked on. As as long as uh, one of my troubleshooting messages on intercom is "Are you on Google Chrome?" <laughs> you know, I think I think we're not there yet. Uh, I really don't know where where we are with that right now. Uh, I don't know what the how, how the focus is there. I really hope we can integrate it with more browsers because a lot of the times people use machinations and get confused uh, over things that should be working, and the only reason that they don't work is just because you are not using Chrome and yeah, it's a bit limiting. And on behalf of everybody, uh, don't worry, the request for dark mode is is constantly discussed internally. We're always thinking about, you know, when can we add dark mode? It sounds like such a simple thing to add dark mode. Uh, if only it were, uh, it is complex to add dark mode to machinations. It requires whole new UI updates and changes so that things work in dark mode rather than light mode and you know still look good and still function. Um, but we've heard that and uh, we'll get there. At the moment, a lot of people kind of um, spoof dark mode by changing the background color um, into a slightly darker color. So it's yeah, I was going to suggest that scuffed alternative. You can switch the background color to something more dark, and it's. It's, it's just like dark one, basically. <laughs> Rather than it being bright white, you can change that to a nice dark color. If you go black, you do start to lose all of the resource connections. Um, but there's definitely definitely options there. You might want to have a garish red color, but I, I don't know who's uh, crazy enough to want that color as their background. Perfect. This has been lots of fun. Thank you all very much for joining us. It was a great session today, really pleased. We're so excited about how these new custom variables are going to impact people's game development. Um, and then uh, kind of love your feedback. So uh, you know, any su suggestions you have, any thoughts you have on you know what would make your lives easier in machinations, or what would improve it, please do come and join us in the Discord channel. I saw Horia already kind of dropped that link in there. Um, so please do come and join us. Oh, quick question, just as I'm wrapping up. Uh, what about some kind of automated player, some random or slightly scripted AI to fake input for some players and diagrams? Do you have some plans for this in your roadmap? Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, so at the moment, um, Chezos, the, the master of building these AI type players, um, I don't know if we're at the moment machinations is true and complete so you can you can build any of these things um inside machinations using the using the logic there already to kind of create all sorts of different player logic and player uh data um but oh i've just been pinged yes we're looking into it <laughs> live and direct from the hotline uh in the back channels so yes apparently we're looking at it. i'll leave it at that I don't know anymore. Oh, I think we could do. I think we've got a couple of things on our road on our kind of request list from uh, previous webinars. The first one was for us to do. It was an RPG um, skill tree progression system. Uh, another request. Let's do a masterclass on AI kind of uh, AI kind of players from Cheza. What do you think, Chizzo? You're up for doing a, a webinar on building player logic and AI? Yes, but be warned, my players, my bots are really dumb and basic. Uh, so yes, uh, as Matthew said, you can build them as complex as you want. You will sometimes notice that it's not worth placing an extra 3,000 nodes on the campus just to simulate a bit of a smarter player and rather just leave them dumb and performing basic actions according to very basic rules, basically. 
Uh, we've been doing a lot of kind of, uh, we did a very secretive project recently that I can't talk about, but um, looking at the difference between kind of real world play testing and simulated play testing through machinations and kind of where it gets really interesting is how you can combine the results of both because you know, machinations is great for testing and iterating on your economy you're still going to have people play test the game to find bugs and do things with it so how how do you think about that workflow between simulated play tests and economy testing and machinations and combining that with the power of kind of real world play tests and real players playing your game for the first time um i think it's a fascinating subject and um, i think it would make a great uh, session one day maybe we'll do that with the ai um type session at some point that's true ai players is a guarantee to save us from terminator like future and i think on that beautiful sum up uh, and vision for the future i'll wrap it up for today so thank you very very much everybody for joining us it was a great session we always enjoy these and it's great to get your feedback and your involvement in these sessions and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next next one thanks bye Thank you.